Welcome to What Physicists Do. Uh, as you know, in the series, we're always looking to bring in um, different voices, different perspectives, and you know that I often like to bring people who work at intersections between disciplines. And I think this is um, a well-timed talk to have a talk about science and the intersection of science and the public and public policy at an intersection. I was just talking to our speaker, Dr. Kai Vetter, um, outside, and have this. Uh, this I, I knew that this would be a good talk, and I'm I'm excited about his enthusiasm here today and his thoughts. Dr. Kai Vetter is of UC Berkeley, where he's he is head of the Applied uh, Nuclear Physics Program at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and he's director for the Institute for Resilient Communities. Uh, these are some things that he'll be talking about here today. His bachelor's degree is in physics from the Technical University of Darmstadt. His PhD is from Goethe University in Frankfurt. Uh, among his outstanding uh, work are um, things uh, that we'll learn about today called DoseNet and RadWatch, and his work regarding Fukushima and the, and the Japanese um, uh, nuclear incident at Fukushima, for which he won the uh, American Nuclear Society's uh, presidential citation. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Kai Vetter. Thank you, Scott, for the introduction. Pleased to be here to share some of the work we have been engaged in over the last several years in Berkeley, uh, specifically at uh, our Applied Nuclear Physics Program at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which I'm leading, and within the Department of Nuclear Engineering at UC Berkeley, and in our institute in Berkeley as well. So even though I am teaching at the Department of Nuclear Engineering, I still see myself as a nuclear physicist, so as a physicist by training, and still what we do is I claim to be physics, so I, I think at least I meet this requirement to speak here in the series of what physicists do. <laughs> now, um, but it's quite fascinating that we still do what physicists do conventionally, that is exploring or studying the fundamental constituents in the world and the interactions of those. So really more the fundamental science aspect. So we still do that too. However, we have to recognize that some of the technologies uh, we are developing, to, of course, to uh, achieve the better understanding in the world around us uh, can have an immense positive impact in uh, our daily life in terms of technology we develop, which have an impact in our daily life. But we also have to recognize that they come potentially with some risks. Therefore, it is becoming more important over the last few years, or even 10, 10 to 15 years, to not only to pursue the research to gain better understanding or to gain knowledge, but also to communicate with the public about these advances and explain what they imply for basic research, but also potentially in their daily life, and the fact that they might come with some risks. Just the concept of risk is a critical concept which is widely misunderstood in the public. So it's not just about the negative impact, but also the probability that something can happen, which is widely ignored. So just the concept of risk is something we have to educate. So, but in the broader context, we have to be aware that we not only have to pursue uh, the basic research, but also to communicate about the excitement about these advances and the potential benefits or uh, negative effects of these advances. And that's true not only for the physical sciences, but also very important for biological sciences, chemical sciences. So for example, um, vac vaccination is an important example, which of course you can argue is not really advanced technology anymore, but you might think, particularly in the United States, well, it is kind of, because people are still afraid of the side effect of the risk of vaccination, even though it's absolutely essential for survival of humankind to get vaccinated, and, but it's still feared because the mis potential the misunderstanding about the risk, about the positive and the negative effects. Or other examples are, for example, genetic modified uh, organisms, GMOs. One has to be aware of the advances and advantages and necessity in some areas of the world, but also about the risk. So balancing the advantage and the, and the risk is very important. And the same then applies to nuclear energy. 
Now, I'm not any want to put any value in, in terms of the need in nuclear power, but even nuclear power, as we have seen in nuclear in Fukushima or Chernobyl 30 plus years ago, even nuclear power comes with a risk. For that matter, burning fossil fuel, of course, comes with a risk about climate change too. So whatever you do in, in terms of energy technology, they all come with some risk as well. <coughs> now, since I'm a nuclear physicist, of course, I focus on nuclear stuff. Uh, on, on one hand, of course, then to uh, study the atomic nucleus, um, which means more the strong interactions or the weak interactions, because after all, the neutrino, which is weakly interacting, comes from the nucleus as well, and that's what we do in our basic research component. Um, but we also uh, pursue, of course, research which is more applicable, for example, in Fukushima. So what I'm going to talk about then today is it's really two aspects. Is one more the, uh, the outreach and education component using simple sensors, but to allow us to introduce the, the basic science and engineering concepts in schools, ultimately to have an impact in society. And then I move on to more the advanced technologies we have developed over the last several years, which are becoming or have become and become even more important off-site when we want to have most of the people which are still evacuated in Fukushima are supposed to go back and to ensure their safety when they go back. And of course, help in the decommissioning of the three units at the Daiichi nuclear power plant, which will take another 50 to 70 years for the full decommissioning of the reactor. Enormous efforts. And what we are trying to do to help them support these efforts uh, with our advanced technology. So these are the two examples I want to, I want to discuss today. Again, more uh, in terms of this, the outreach, outreach and education, which we, in the context of the Berkeley Red Watch program, the DoseNet program, and then moving on from the basic radiation detection concept to, uh, to gamma ray vision. So ultimately realizing one of, the, one of the kind of dreams of humankind to actually see radiation, which, we are, which I will show you what we are actually able now to make radiation in our world visible. Um, now, gamma rays. Again, the focus is on gamma rays, gamma ray vision, gamma ray radiation. And gamma rays is also quite an in interesting example by itself because gamma rays have been certainly subject of science, scientific discovery, biomedical or medical imaging. Like if you go to uh, the, the uh, radiology department, you get probably an, an, an PET or SPEC um, image, or uh, food safety, nuclear safety, nuclear security, and even so in movies. And it has certainly been subject of movies as well. I'm not sure if some of you have seen The Incredible Hulk, where the drug was, create, was created by, the, by laser beams. And as a matter of fact, this movie was, was actually made in, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab using one of the state-of-the-art gamma ray spectrometers. Instead of so, absorbing gamma rays from the target, they inverted it and have the instrument, which was called gamma sphere, to emit the radiation into the person in the middle. So kind of inversion of that, but nevertheless, beautiful instrument. Um, so gamma rays also subject of movies. So, uh, and, but it's fascinating though, on one hand, of course, it still remains uh, an, a very important tool uh, in for the technologies, but also is of course feared by the public because it is, after all, it's radiation, right? And radiation is harmful, which is true depending on the dose, like right? the amount of radiation per time, as pretty much with anything in our world. If you get too much in a short time, it will be harmful. The same with radiation, the same with ionizing radiation, such as gamma rays. So, okay, this was kind of the, the outline. My introductory remarks are pretty much done now. So that was my, uh, my introductory remarks. What physicists do, and again, this <coughs> itself could of course be just a whole lecture, of course. But I want to say a few words about our Berkeley Applied Nuclear Physics program. Um, just give you some flavor. Um, what, we, what we do, and then the two examples. One, in terms of the outreach, uh, our Berkeley Red Watch and the DoseNet program, where we're coming from, what we want to achieve, and maybe get you uh, interested to join that program, which is possible. And then more the advanced concept uh, of seeing gamma rays. So I want to show you the basic concept and where we are right now to visualize radiation in 3D, in color, in our world. Now, just, again, that's really busy, and I have to step back myself to see that. <laughs> it's supposed to be a busy slide, just indicating that we do a lot of different things. So we have about 40 people in our program, 
Um, and we do a typically 20 to 25 projects at the same time. So on the top left is more the basic concept and the detectors we are developing and we are building in Berkeley. So these are detectors, these are semiconductor detectors, germanium, silicon, cadmium, zinc, telluride, cadmium, telluride. So all kinds of different semiconductor detectors which allow us to detect ionizing radiation very easily and very powerfully. So in terms of detection, in terms of spectroscopy, in terms of precision. So we make these detectors ourselves. So this is, for example, the detector, which is called the point P-type point contact germanium detector, whatever that means. I don't have time to talk about that. But this has been used now in an experiment, which is called Majorana, which is looking for the neutrinoless double beta decay in germanium 76, addressing one of the fundamental questions in physics about the property of the neutrino whether it is in its own antiparticle. And the neutrino-less double beta decay, if observed, would point to the out that it would, the neutrino is, as a matter of fact, its own antiparticle. Of course, which is against uh, the lepton number conservation, therefore is against the standard model. <coughs> but there are quite a few efforts on the way, and one of which is using this specific implementation of a detector, which was developed at Berkeley and we are, we are building, contributing to this pretty big experiment. So again, there I can, each, each of these points is certainly a lecture, at least one. Uh, I want to point out, I want to mention about astrophysics. So this is the uh, nuclear compton telescope, which is called, since nuclear is a bad word, so they changed the name to COSI. It's now the Compton Spectrometer and Imager, but they're still the same, so it's an array of these position sensitive germanium detectors. It's a gamma ray imager and which was thrown on a balloon for gamma ray astro uh, uh, um, astrophysics to look at, for example, a gamma ray burst. So that was just launched uh, one and a half years ago. It landed actually uh, on the southern hemisphere on land and has really exciting results in terms of uh, astrophysics, looking at stellar evolution or gamma ray, uh, for example, bursts, so really, uh, 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 massive events which you do not understand much about yet. So we're also providing the detectors for these types of experiments. So then going over more to the, to the uh, systems and, to, and other concepts, so we go from uh, small-scale systems to uh, uh, large-scale truck-based system. That's our RAT map system, which is a truck full of, uh, uh, of, of stuff, of instruments, $3 million worth of instruments. We go out to potentially, just simply to understand the world. That means the background radiation, because some of the issues or you know, the challenges we're trying to address in our work for homeland security is to detect small weak sources uh, which could potentially use of course for radiological events or nuclear events. So we're looking for the detection of small signatures and the detection in general is about signal to background ratio. While we might not be able to do much about the signal, of course we can shield material. What we can do is better understand the background and the background variations in the cinematic and statistical background variations. So this truck is just there to allow us to better understand background variation in the world. Of course, not just radiation background, but for example, can we correlate radiation background with other, other signatures in the world, visual features, hyperspectral features, temperature, weather data? Because we know there is correlation between the radiation being exposed on the data basis and other signatures such as just the composition of buildings, whether it's concrete building, whether it's a wood building. Right? We know there are differences. Knowing that al allows us to, in to inform our algorithm to enhance the detection. Quite significant. Um, so this is just one example. We actually were building systems for, this is a Bell helicopter flying across Berkeley, so we're also <coughs> developing systems to replace and to really make to, for, for this kind of system, which are, we have two in the country by DOE and NSA, uh, in terms of emergent response and mapping. So we're also involved to uh, apply, to develop, and then deploy our advanced detection concepts in these platforms. And all the way to quadcopters and, and, and so medium-sized unmanned aerial vehicles, UASs or UAVs, and really small ones. So the systems we develop can be deployed on any platform, from the small to medium-sized to large-sized manned helicopters to uh, uh, pocket-sized detectors, can carry it, backpack-mounted, car-mounted, truck-mounted systems. So any dimension. But what we are trying to do is, of course, to leverage the fundamental concept we're developing to make it useful then for all the platforms. 
All right, and uh, one example I want to point out though here is, is this plot, which uh, in terms of radiation mapping and monitoring, this is already the illustration of gamma ray vision. I will discuss that later. So this is really how we visualize gamma radiation. Now, I want to point in here, because that is uh, related to what happened in Fukushima, but it also illustrates what you can do today in terms of nuclear forensics. Because what we look here is the, uh, when we see here is the abundance of cesium-137 and cesium-137 and many other radioisotopes were released at the, uh, at the incident, at the accident of the DG nuclear power plants in March uh, 11, 2011, so more than five years ago. And what you can do now in Berkeley, again, 5,400 miles away, you can measure those in air, in rainwater, and you can now look at the abundances and the ratios of these different isotopes. And you can actually determine what happened, at what stage uh, the, uh, the, the, was the, the shutdown happened of the unit, 5,400 miles away. So these are the models, and again, some of them is more different, like iodine has a different chemistry, like volatility, which is very difficult, They're different between the isotopes. But the ones which are not at all, you can really agree very well with the projection of the modeling, taking account the information available about the state of the operation of the three units in at the day So we can do that, again, 5,400 miles away in a forensic. So it's really the CSI at work. Right? So at the end, we're still waiting to be invited to actually have that as one of the sequence of CSI. Um, illustrating, though, the advances or the, the technology, advanced technology we have available today to make that happen. Yes? Is that a geranium detector? Yes. 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 Exactly. So again, it's not a technology which is just developed in the last 10 years. So this is was already developed 40 years ago. Absolutely. Um, I'll speak about that. So, but the point when I'm in here, so it will be involved in many different projects, but we always go from the concepts to systems to applications. And vers uh, vice versa. So also, we, so we're driving on one hand application, but of course we are being driven also by application and the needs to en enhance technologies. So this is our team, talk about what physicists do today, particularly in the experimental uh, world. We work with teams. That's really teamwork is essential. Uh, we have to work with others. We can, for the most part in physics, that cannot do <coughs> things just by ourselves, particularly in experimental physics. So this is our team, about 40 <coughs> people. We have quite a few scientists again, at LBL, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, then we have quite a few postdocs, quite a few graduate students, and quite a few undergraduate students. Again, making use of the quite unique opportunity in Berkeley to combine education training at UC Berkeley. And as a matter of fact, not only of in the, within the Department of Nuclear Engineering, but we work with physics students, we work with uh, students from computer sciences, we work with student operational research. Um, and coupling them and us to the research being done at Lawrence Berkeley. And it's just a five minute, well, 10 minute walk up the hill for my, from, uh, our, for my building. Um, seven minutes down, maybe 12 minutes up. Or it takes a shuttle. Um, so still, really closely related. It's quite unique in the world. And what is nice too, so this is our building, the patio, and if you look at so this San Francisco, we actually got lucky when we got this building. So this is Golden Gate, and what we do there is actually like looking. So Sonoma is, so we are over here somewhere, I guess. Well, maybe. Um, Japan is right over there. <laughs> <laughs> is that true? Well, of course not, because you're not know, living on the flat world, right? So Japan is over there. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, and that's really important. So we are, we are neighbors to Japan. It's just water. Uh, remove the water and we are neighbors. And as a matter of fact, the latitude is right Fukushima. So it does connect us. So again, Fukushima, because that's kind of the, what I want to, kind of the main topic is about uh, uh, about research, but also education and outreach around Fukushima, because that's certainly a, a, a need there. So that's kind of picture illustrating one of the hydrogen explosions in one of the units. Again, it happened after, of course, the earthquake, which happened on March 11, which is kind of Thursday to Friday in 2011. And then, uh, of course, the tsunami, which took out pretty much all the power of the units, because the disk generator, which actually put under the ceiling. Right, so 
again, they don't want to talk about that, all the mistakes made, but it happened, it was taken out, there was a uh, shutdown, and therefore uh, loss of cool, cooling, um, leading ultimately to the, uh, to the uh, removal of the water and, then, <coughs> and the release of the hydrogen, ultimately into the hydrogen explosions. At the same time, of course, the, the core, the fuel melted already of three units which were properly in that and operational. So this is one of the uh, uh, hydrogen explosions. Of course, with this explosion, it's clear there was enormous uh, releases of radioactivity from, this, from the, from the, uh, from the uh, fission fragments, particularly, into the environment. Not only local, not at the same scale as Chernobyl, again, more than 30 years ago, but still significant releases. And then, of course, so an enormous impact, no doubt, in, and we'll get back to the impact in a, in a, in a few minutes. Um, but no doubt, enormous impact in terms of society, in terms of the uh, economy, <coughs> and the perception about Japan. Now, let's move on then to California, what we did in California in response to what happened in Fukushima. Because clearly, uh, the challenge is that is not, the, as soon as we have these releases into the atmosphere, it does not stay local. It will be transported around the world. Um, and the world transport is very efficient. The jet stream, if you go into the level of jet stream, extremely efficient transport. So, so, but well known, so we, begin, we were able to predict how long it would take for the release radiation or radioactive materials to reach California. So the prediction was 60 hours, and it was within an hour that we were able to see. Because at that time, in March 2011, it was still, well, it, it rains again in California, but of course a few years happened. So at that time, there was enormous rain storm. And of course, releasing and washing out most of the, a lot of the radioactivity in the clouds onto us in Berkeley. So it's really easy to detect. That's really what I indicated before. It's really easy to detect. Doesn't mean it's dangerous. I guess the sensitivity of the system is so enormous. Now, air transport 60 hours. So we had 60 hours to prepare our measurements. In contrast to Japan, which did not have any time, which is a big problem and has to be improved in the future. Like everything, pretty much all the local uh, radiation meters were taken out, either, either by the earthquake or by the tsunami. It's unacceptable, but that would happen. Now, we were lucky enough, we had 60 hours of scramble things together and did all measurements. Now, the ocean currents happens too. Not quite as effect effective, because really the transport is not one-dimensional, but actually it's three-dimensional. Uh, but nevertheless, we expected to see something. We're still looking, but we haven't seen some but others have enormous effort actually saw some season 137, some season 134 in, uh, in ocean water, but extremely, extremely low. What is though the main problem, and that's what I want to point out, it's a local event with global impact, not only because of the actual physical or chemical transport, like the world without borders, but because <coughs> of the media. And 20 years ago, it would have been just the public media which have been vetted and were kind of trustworthy, but have been completely replaced by social media. And there's no vetting whatsoever. It's just whatever claim you want to believe, that's out there. And it, the, the, the more outrageous the claim, the more hits you will get, and the more ultimately that will be believed. An enormous problem in our society. The misuse of social media. And there's really not that much you can do about that. However, what you can do, and what we should do, particularly for us as a scientist, we have to be there to provide trusted information. Not just whatever is on the social network, what people believe or what people's opinion on. We have to go back to data, to make sure the data are publicized and will be discussed in the public and explained to the public as a, and as a trusted research. This is fundamentally important to counter the social networks. We, again, we cannot avoid, but that's, and that's true for, again, for radiation, it's true for all the, uh, kind of, uh, what, I, what I mentioned before, genomes and our vaccination. All right, so big problem. So to counter that, what we did, and, okay, let's go on. What we, we established what we, what we call the Berkeley Rational Watch Project. Um, independent measurements, by us and our students at UC Berkeley do this measurement, but also make all the measurement of the sounds available to the public to inform the public and engage the public and the media 
in a dialogue about what we see and what it means, which is particularly with regard to radiation, an enormous challenge because of the enormous misperception about radiation. Because the perception is any radiation can kill you, which is possible, but extremely unlikely. It's just going out into the sun and get skin cancer. It's possible, but extremely unlikely. Not only that you'll have damage, but we have so many repair mechanisms to repair damage. I mean, that's why we are still alive and we're living in the radioactive world. So, so we established the Berkeley Red Watch program and we did measurements like that. So we have, for example, look at iron 131 in rainwater. We have big tarps, the fundamental stuff we collect in rainwater. We reduced it and then just put it in front of the germanium detector to count it. And yes, we were easily do, able to see iodine 131 in rainwater. And you might argue, oh, well, we can see it must be dangerous. So iodine 131. <coughs> now, so we appeared and disappeared. But if you put that in context, you have to drink about 140 liters of this rainwater, which I would not recommend anyway in order <laughs> to drink the rainwater. But you have to drink 140 liters of that to get the same exposure than a cross-country flight. Which, of course, we, well, the grown ups and I certainly do all the time across the planet. So that's an important reference. Yes, you can see very easily, but the context is, is not really harmful. The other example is C137 in local milk. So, yes, yeah, after some time, because it takes a while to bottling, of course, and it doesn't really show up in the, in the store, it takes a few, uh, couple of uh, some days. So we saw the increase and the decrease, so appearance and disappearance. Uh, of course, a little delayed, a little different. Okay, that's a, a topic by itself. Now, 0.5 becquerel per liter. So we should remind ourselves that when we eat and drink, for example, milk, we take up potassium 40. Uh, potassium 40 is every particular potassium, being in a little hope. But uh, uh, so it's quite abundant in milk. And when we drink a liter, we get 50 becquerel of potassium 40. This is chemically very similar to cesium. So we get 50. That means we get about a factor 100 more when we drink a liter of milk. Okay. We should definitely not stop drinking milk because of that. So, but these re references are critically important. Yes, you can measure it, but you have to put it in context. All the measurements are important. Um, however, now, so this is kind of one of the recognition at that time, too, that we have to put that in context of resilience. We have to be more resilient to things like that. Resilience means, of course, the, re the ability to recover after something bad happens. So it becomes, became a very popular word now. Sustainability was kind of the, the 90s and 2000s, and now it's resilience becomes quite popular. But both of them actually make sense, because things will happen in the future. We have to accept that things will happen. We have to accept it, and we have to be better prepared to rebound after something. We have to enhance it. And that is, of course, pointing out the technologies, but also in terms of the understanding. That's not, it's not good enough to provide information. We have to have an informed public to make use of that information, to be better able to this. Now, uh, one more example in terms of what we did in part, as part of the Berkeley Network program. But there were again a lot of claims, and one very interesting claim was a guy with a Geiger counter going to Harpoon Bay on the beach, on the, on the um, and so he saw us. It changed when he went from the from the from the from the grass to the beach. He saw a difference in his Geiger counter. Again, very simple counter. It's like that. I brought. I always have one with me. Just make sure. So and he walked up to the beach, and he saw an increase in his count rate, and therefore he was saying, "Oh, it's from Fukushima." because it's on the beach, so it must be from Fukushima. And again, everyone else lied, all the experts lied, because I proved to you that it's radioactive, the beach, and it's from Fukushima. So that went viral. Within a week or so, we had uh, a million hits, and of course, most of them are thumbs up. Yes, yeah, great, because all, uh, we all, again, that's a fundamental problem too, the distrust. It's easy to distrust the scientists, other trust in your, uh, so again, he, sh he claimed to be confirmed the proof because he went there. So we went there. Uh, so one of our graduate students and, and I went to this beach, and of course, with the state of the art gamma ray spectrometer. So that's a mechanical cool germanium detector, which we ha happen to have. We do have 
all this equipment. Again, that's $100,000 equipment. Again, not many people have that. That's only $100 compared to $100,000 equipment. But we have that, so we go there and do the measurements. And uh, we can reproduce the dose rate, what he showed. So you go from the back to the beach, yes, you see that. But what we can do, we can now identify the different natural occurring isotopes, such as potassium 40. More importantly, because now we're talking about sand. Right? We're talking about an area which is geologically very active. Right? There, are, there are a lot of thorium and uranium, and there's the black sand and the white sand. And the particular the black sand is, is, it has actually a lot of thorium. Um, and we can now understand, so when you look at the Geiger counter, this is dark bar, and then the other bars is correlate very well in terms of the counts. Clearly indicating what you're seeing with the Geiger counter, which is just simple counting, is, is due to the change in the uranium and thorium in the sand, which is naturally occurring. And we do not see any indication from Fukushima, which we can easily identify because of the cesium-137, cesium-134, all the other isotopes, which are necessary to associate the measurement with um, Fukushima. And that's really <coughs> the challenge, of course, what you cannot do with the Geiger counter. So again, problem, how do distinguish radiation identify? Again, you just count. You just have a counter here in your end device. So if you look at the gamma ray spectrum, this is a gamma ray spectrum where you plot the counts where there's the energy of a germanium detector. And this is uh, one the rainwater sample I showed you sometimes. So this is the, the measurement with the most of the contamination. And you can see the, in color the different fusion products we observed, again, in this one measurement. But more importantly, there are a lot of other lines. You need such a detector to be able to identify separate ones. If you look at just the natural background here, so this is now without any uh, 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 fusion products. So these are the, the spectrum you normally have just by background. And you see all the different components, which are most of them due to the decay from uranium, thorium, and potassium-40. So potassium-40 is specifically this one here. And then we have lead-208. So again, so we, this is a typical background spectrum, which we see here. Of course, we cannot resolve with the Geiger counter these kind of features, which you have to if you want to make any claim about the now, one word about the world we're living in. I mean, at the end, what is that? Um, just a few words about the radioactive world we're living in. And we have to accept the fact we're living in a radioactive world. If you want not to be exposed to radioactivity, you have to leave this universe. Because in our universe, it always happens. Which is due to the fact that the half-life of thorium, potassium, and uranium is billions of years, between, between 1.5 to 15 billion years. This will not go away anytime soon. So we have to accept that. And it turns out, well, again, we have been able to survive in this environment. Um, so it's, it's, we have radon gas. We have a lot of exposure. And of course, we have medical procedures, which are now 50% of total exposure to now computer CTs, computer tomographies. Uh, what I always, uh, so you can put numbers in it. I don't want to. What is interesting, though, that everyone is radioactive. And I always point that out. This even being close to another person, of course, increases your exposure to radiation. Again, about the benefits for this risk. So I think I would clearly um, take the risk to get the exposure in being close to another person rather than being afraid being close to the person because of the small. But again, you can measure it. So zero is impossible, and the gamma ray from natural occurring visuals to 14, for example, is almost the same as man made. So again, gamma ray is a gamma ray. Now, as an example, that's also kind of interesting, even though I have to get going here. Um, uranium-238, the decay chain. So that's one of the, what we call, primordial um, elements or radioisotopes, which have been with us from the start, from these creation of heavy elements, and will be with us, because the half-life is 4.5 billion years. So uranium-238. It decays in these specific steps, uh, particularly to radium, for example. Radon, so radon is the guy who does make that problem because it's gas. So even though you might think, oh, uranium is confined to rock, but as long as as soon as it decays in the radon, it's actually uh, released and comes in, in the extra, and then of course released into the environment. Therefore, you see all the, the products below it everywhere, particularly in basements, because radon is heavier than air, it sinks down and actually accumulates in basements. 
That's why in some areas where you have more of the read-on, you have to be careful about how much time you spend in your basement. Another interesting piece is this guy, Polony to 10. Have you ever heard about Polony to 10? Have you heard about Alexander Litvinenko? The Russian spy who was killed by Polonium 210 in 2006. He was a former uh, spy, Russian spy, and since he was, uh, uh, again, telling too much of the details, um, that's at least the assumption, he was killed uh, by Polonium 210, which is a really tricky business because Polonium 210 only decays by a alpha decay with 138 day half life, so it's quite potent, and does not emit any gamma ray. That means you cannot detect it externally. So you actually have to open it up and then use your alpha spectrometer to actually measure it. And that confirmed indeed that it was below the decay. So you can use it as a poison, but you also have to recognize it's part of the world we're living in because it's part of this decay chain. So we, can, we all, part of us is polonium 210. <coughs> if you eat fish, for example, you eat polonium 210. As a matter of fact, if you want to estimate the exposure the, 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 the main component of your exposure in radiation when you eat fish is actually polonium 210. It's not potassium 40. Because a small amount is sufficient because of the alpha decay okay, to, to, to increase your effective dose. Again, you should not be worried and stop eating fish. But you have to recognize, oh, it's part of our national environment. Our, uh, the world we're living in again, contains polonium 210. Which again, if you select it and, and eat it uh, in higher concentration, you will get killed. So just a couple of examples of, of, uh, of, of, of about the world we're living in. OK, so now the more recent updates. So what we did then as part of the Berkeley Lab Watch, we, we got one of these nicely and a uh, nice and expensive gamma ray germanium, mechanical germanium attacker, and we just put on the roof and continue to do air monitoring measurements. So we have a $100,000 piece of equipment on the roof just measuring that out. And the goal with that is just to have it there and to com help to communicate to the public. So in particular in Berkeley, there are a lot of concerned citizens in Berkeley concerned about many things, including radiation. <laughs> so we can tell them if they, if they are concerned about cesium, we will see it or not. Because this is a very sensitive thing. We can see easily all the naturally occurring cytology books, which I just indicated, and its variation. It's not that even in one location it's stable. It does change a lot. But factor 10 is you can see easily the different components because of the meteorological conditions. The wind directions make a big difference. The pressure makes a big difference. So it does change all the time. And that's naturally uh, happening. So that's just the air sitting. And you should definitely encourage you to check that out, redwatch.berkeley.edu. It's all there online, all data, and you can I mean, feel free to, to do it, make use of that. It's quite unique in the world. Um, so you can make it. Okay. Now, so that's kind of the, our Berkeley Red Watch program. Now, the DoseNet, it was also, we also recognized the kind of uh, the need to involve schools in terms of the education. Because, of course, it's much easier to have an impact with school children, which are a little more open minded with, than grown ups, and ultimately educate children to ultimately infiltrate in a way at homes. Um, so we do a ghost net, which is the, the goal is to establish a, a network of the simple dosimeters, the dosimeters which actually our own students design to make it really very cheaply available. Give it to schools, they can, they, can, uh, um, they can mount it, and they can be part of our network to analyze the data they actually collect. So we have the measurements and providing all the tools necessary to analyze the data. So we have now uh, 13 here in the Bay Area, and then uh, a couple in a couple in Asia, and and, and, we, yeah, and, and one in Sweden. So we expanded. It. So we started about a year ago. So again, building a scientific literacy through a network of radiation sensors, <coughs> in schools see and learn what is normal in our world by applying fundamental science and engineering concepts, doing measurements themselves, and doing that analysis, but providing state-of-the-art tools to provide to the students. So this is kind of a network. So we have uh, quite a few, again, we have ten, tens of those um, across the world. And again, then, uh, in, in terms of the communication, of course, based on the website, making all the data available. This is our the system we have built, um, which is based on the Raspberry Pi, a little silicon pin diode we get from, uh, from Japan. So it's like $20, $30. And then we have a Raspberry Pi. 
Um, and we have uh, Linux running on it, we have a Python running it, we have Jupyter Notebook on it. Okay, so again, state-of-the-art tools, software, hardware tools, make that available to the, to the schools. So they can do their own studies then. Um, so we are two schools to inform them about the opportunities. So we have about uh, 13, 14 schools and about six uh, uh, research institutions across the world. Not part of it. We are very much interested to reach out to many other schools, including maybe here. Um, so we are also expanding, so not only expanding across uh, countries, across cultures, like in Japan, Japan, and Korea, of course, it's quite different how they see data, and how they see their channels. So appreciate that, but also, um, in order to put the radiation into a different context, to add other sensors, meteorological sensors, air pollution sensors, so air particles uh, sensors, carbon dioxide sensors. We are, we are reaching, expanding that also in terms of different domains, what you can, what you should know about all the world, about the world around us. And that's all, in a way, is part of our Institute of Civic Communities, and the, the three pillars, education, science, and communities, Context of facilities, uh, which we, again, that's part of the, the advertising for our institute for Australian communities. But that's as much as I want to say here. Because now we want to go to Japan and discuss about the more advanced technologies we have developed for many reasons, but one of the reasons is to support the activities on site and off site the Daiichi Nuclear Power Plant in Japan. So this is a picture, it was one of the first map of contamination taken actually by the DOE NNSA office. So while Japan, Japanese response teams were really strong, uh, scrambling with their own stuff, again, there was a tsunami which hit. There was an earthquake which hit. So in addition, there was a Daiichi nuclear power plant accident. So not many resources available to just take care of that. So the DOE stepped in and sent their state-of-the-art equipment over there. And they're the first one to actually do this mapping. You might remember this infamous um, uh, extension of the contamination to the northwest, which was not expected. I mean, it was not according to the weather prediction. Right? But again, weather prediction go only so far. It was not expected that the weather would change, the wind direction would change, and then induce this valley here. So again, measurements are critically important. And then, of course, according to that, people evacuated, and are still remaining evacuated. And as a matter of fact, even five, more, five plus years later, um, we still have more than 70,000 people evacuated. And most of them, though, encouraged, are uh, supposed to moved back March 17th, so in like four or five months. Most of them are expected to move back. By decision by the Prime Minister, I can talk about communication, that's again another nightmare, but, but he decided last year that most of the people go back without any input, of course. But, um, so most of them will move back, except some areas which are still a little more contaminated and therefore they should not go back to this. But most of them are supposed to go back in March. So now I've been a, a, a resident there, of course, I would be also very much concerned going back about uh, my home and about worried about the contamination of my home. Is it really trustworthy? That is clear. But one point I want to make though too, which is remarkable, I think. And some of you might be aware of that, but so the main and significant health impact is really due to psychological stress, which is absolutely measurable. So expectation by now is even up to 2,000 people died because of the uh, um, instantaneous evacuation um, and the uncertainty about their own exposure, their future, but also their uh, economical future. There was an uh, enormous amount of obesity, uh, uh, alcoholism, uh, lack of workout, and which was absolutely measurable in terms of health effects, absolutely measurable. On the other hand, if you look at the effect of the radiation, most of the international organizations agree that there will be no measurable effect due to the radiation. It does not mean that there will not be an effect, but it will not be measurable, because as you might know, the long-term effect of radiation is cancer. And the sober news for, for us being male is that 40 to 50% of males will get cancer. That means the background, the cancer background rate is really high. That means you have variation in that background rate. And, it's, and we will not be able to see a change in that significant deviation of that due to that deviation. So it will not be, that's what we mean, it's not measurable. It can be there, but it will not be measured. So the question is, should we be concerned? Sure, we should be concerned, but how much we should be concerned? 
So the main challenge is, again, returning to normal life, with that easy set then happens. And I've been, by the way, I've been to Fukushima 15 times over the last four years. So I get a lot of exposure just by flying there, much more than actually being there. <laughs> um, so how will the condominium kind of change over time? That's what the scientists now have to answer. What is the impact of low dose exposure? Also the scientists to answer, which is both extremely difficult question to answer. So what we are trying to do is, is to provide better means to assess okay, the contamination on site and off site. Because today, what the Japanese have is kind of simple detection system. They had the cars around it, but now there's mail map by now, but not very effective. So what we are de de demonstrating there is more advanced concepts, specifically in gamma ray imaging. So that's what we have developed over the last 10 years. Much more advanced gamma ray imaging concepts, which allows much more effective mapping of the contamination on side and off side. So we, with that, we can more effectively map the contamination and verify the decontamination efforts. Again, the enormous efforts, enormous billions of dollars in spent on the decontamination. Whether it's useful or not, that's a different question, but enormous efforts. And it's really remarkable about the cleanup, off site and on site. So you, now you can go right to the unit two or one, right next to it, and it's safe. But because of the enormous efforts, which of course is not what we discussed in the public. Headlines. But it's enormous. It's again in the units, it's still a mess, but, but off site, it's enormous advances. And okay. So we still want to help to map and uh, verify, uh, guide, clean up repopulation activities, inform the environment of radiological transport models. Again, that's very important to, to determine what happens over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Because a lot of this radioactivity is still captured in the forest, 70% of Fukushima Prefecture is forest. It's mountainous forest. It's, un it's, 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 it's a very complex landscape environments, and most of it is there and will be released over the next 30, 40 years. So how do we do this? Support the assessment of radiation exposure, and so on, and ensure the return of the, of the safety of the homes. So can, can we show them that it's safe? No. So that's off-site, where the people are going back to and uh, to their homes. But also on site, we want to deploy our advanced technologies to help to assess the reactor cores. Again, three of the reactors are still sitting there, and nobody knows really where they are, the reactor debris, and what the, what the situation is in the pressure zone. Because it's like fire, right? it's still really hot there. And they're trying to get access to it, but it's extremely difficult. So that's now the focus moving from the off site to the on site. So gamma ray imaging, so that's what we are developing. So uh, you might have heard about that. The typical uh, 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 kind of context you, you, you learn about imaging is, is medical imaging. For example, positron emission tomography. This is the donut, which is based on the coincidence of the, of the uh, beta plus decay and then the annihilation of uh, positronium, the emission of two 500 WK photons, which define the line of response you can use for the reconstruction. So it's kind of the gamma ray, gamma ray imaging 101 in a nutshell. Uh, so you define this line of response. So we can do that with this donut here, with this, this array of protectors. And then it makes beautiful pictures, uh, very useful and powerful pictures, of course, about disease staging. Or, so that's for PET, or and then you have the alternative, you only have one gamma ray emitted, for example, TEC-99 or IE-9131. Um, you have uh, slightly different systems because you have to use collimators, heavy collimators, define your line of response. And that allows you to do the deconstruction. Systems look a little different. You have a gantry, but these are the detector heads, which you move around okay, and take the projections, so different images from different directions, so you can ultimately do the tomographic deconstruction. That means that provides then the slices in the 3D deconstruction. So that's great. However, cannot be really used in Fukushima. Like, again, this is local. It's, you can have a patient in this donut, which is nice, but it doesn't really help you if you want to map a room like that. So it has to be completely different. Also, the collimator is to help. You cannot carry that around. So what we have developed is what we call the Compton camera. So using the Compton scattering process, like when gamma ray hits an electron, it scatters, and with a specific kinetic relationship between the scattering angle and the energy, we can use that because we can determine energies and, and, and positions of the individual gamma ray interactions in our detectors, and that allows us to reconstruct 
the into the gummery without using color. So we can measure the two interactions, the gamma ray from here, interacts Compton scattering and then photoelectric absorption as an example. So we can measure the energies on the position of these interactions, which allows us to reconstruct the incident direction to a cone. Now if you have many events, you can ultimately form an image without using a color and only have individual elements. So that's what we call the Compton imaging or the instrument is a Compton camera. And that's one of the quite unique examples of a hand portable Compton camera. So this is in a way our gamma camera. It allows us to determine the direction of the incident gamma rays. That's what you need, of course, to do the imaging. It, it, these are microstrip arrays for the sources. I will say one word about that. Um, there was these systems come in all different flavors, and we build them in all system flavors. This specific one, because it has to be hand portable, is made of what we call uh, coplanar grid cadmium scintillarite detectors. Okay. You don't have time to talk about that, but they're room temperature okay. operational um, semi semiconductor pixels or boxes. Okay. And we have 100 of those arranged in a way which allows us to do coded aperture imaging, and I'm not going to talk about that, but component. Because we have then, we can resolve the interaction, interaction in these individual detector boxes. And that allows us to be constant in a very compact form. So that's about the size. It's about eight pounds, so you can easily carry it around. So, and what it does allow us to do the imaging, and this are spectrometer, so we can also resolve the image. And you can see the color of the radiation. So we can resolve CO22, cesium equivalent as examples, and we can image accordingly. Now, so that's unique by itself, to have that system portable, and we can go but that's not really, that's nice. You can put it somewhere in the environment and let's sit there and just collect data. Which is not very efficient. What you really would like to have is you have your camera camera and you move through a scene. You move the environment. And while you move freely with your system, you map in 3D. Because that now implies that you know about the post. It means you know about the location. So that means position and the orientation of your gamma ray imager relative to your world around you. Because of course now it does matter, the, ori the orientation does matter relative um, the, in the relation to the scene around you. Okay, so that's now in addition what is required. To be able to estimate the pose of your system while you walk through your environment. So that's the second part we have kind of developed over the last five years. Because what we're now doing is to using protection information. So we have visual cameras, we have LiDAR, so uh, light distance and range finding, so LiDAR systems, which allow us to reconstruct the scene around us, that means the surfaces of a room. And with that mapping, we are able now, since we know the relationship between the LiDAR and our, and our detector, to, to determine the pose in that scene. So we go through a scene, reconstruct the scene, and while we do that, we estimate the pose and then project the gamma ray into the scene via just created. And that allows us to go from the simple two dimensional projection to the full three dimensional information. Because now we can do it freely moving tomography. Yes? Is someone going to do this in every room of every house before those people move back? We would like to, um, uh, but it's difficult because, first of all, we only have one. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> And, but even Sumer and argue, well, let's build more, uh, it's extremely difficult in terms of communication with Japanese authorities. Mm -hmm. That's really too bad. It's extremely difficult. That's the side note talk about what physicists do, deal a lot with this bureaucracy in terms of doing measurements over there. It's extremely difficult mm -hmm. in terms of uh, just getting approval to demonstrate and then getting approval to do anything in Japan. Uh, but that's a separate story. So, yes. It, it could be, absolutely, because I will show you that it takes only a few minutes to map one house. All right, so, and just to illustrate the concept, so we have Andy, which is now a scientist with us, um, moving HEMI, this is how it, our, our gamma ray camera is called HEMI, um, through, the, through a scene here in our lab, and here, this is a reconstruction in real time, so you reconstruct the scene, these are point clouds based on uh, actually connect system, it's it kind of light. Um, and you can reconstruct and use that to estimate now your, the path in that scene, you just reconstruct it, and then reconstruct these cones, so the Compton cones, 
into this space. So that ultimately, while you walk through, you reconstruct the scene, you estimate your pose and your path in that scene, and you can that for the double image reconstruction, all in real time. So it took about 40 seconds. You do a full mapping of the space in 3D. You can go in then later and can uh, move around and identify and localize the source in three dimension. Those are the counts. This, these are counts, even though the counts, again, this, yeah, these are the counts. Now imagine, there's only 40 counts to determine the location of the yeah. image. Normally, the medical image, you have 10 to the 8 counts. So that's why you have some noise here, too. So you cannot avoid to have some noise in the image because you're starving of the photons. And that's one of the problems in the numbers. They are just not there. But even without, and that would be impossible to do without moving it before the scene. It would take 30 minutes. If you just would have put it in the middle of the room, it would take about 30 minutes to get the same result. And now by moving it before the scene, because you get <coughs> overcome the one over R squared, so an angle effect, you can make it much, much faster. In in three dimensions, in three dimensions. Okay, so that's just the basic concept. Now it's some, I want to show you some nice figures. So this is one of the contaminated homes we have access to, like enough, about. 10 months ago. And so this is a contaminated house. That's Andy again uh, with this system. So it's a, a computer, a tablet, and Hemi uh, moving around the house and being able to reconstruct the house in 3D. And in addition, finding hot spots in that, in that home. And it, the whole thing took about five minutes. So you walk around the house and you reconstruct the house and using that to back project the radiation. So uh, easily identifying uh, areas which need cleanup. So that's about six months of severe power, whatever that means. So that certainly needs to be cleaned up. So rather than in what is not right now, is again, people are going to that dosimeter from room to room, take about five to ten minute, uh, minutes per room. They have, a, they have a sheet of paper. They, they write that down, black and white, where they were, what time, and what they wrote down. And, and then they go move on to the next like this is all automatically done there anyway. Like you have the time, you have exactly all, all the information. There's no need for writing it down again. And that's what you did 100 years ago. So that's one, one so that's outdoor uh, mapping. Um, then you can do that indoors. So this is the, the first, the second floor uh, uh, living room, which is, was, of course, evacuated after the earthquake. So that would never, otherwise never be possible in a Japanese house to have that uh, chaos there, only neatly. Uh, so we go through, we reconstruct the room in 3D, we even can colorize because of the video cam we have a, a color camera, a real camera, a color camera, and then we can use that to back project the radiation, specifically CZ-137. And we set a gate on CZ-137 and we back project where CZ-137 is coming from, and we can do that again within a few minutes. What is interesting, that again, that was last summer, that was about four and a half years later. So it's still there, and you can identify a leak in the, in the ceiling where the water leaked through, the cesium, again, essentially it's cesium contaminated rainwater, leaked through, uh, uh, um, leaked on the, on the walls into the floor and then accumulated in the mattress. There's mattress like a sponge accumulating, of course, in the water and then in the cesium. You can see that you pour it there. So quite powerful. So we can do that with our hand part of the system. Again, this is now a little more advanced system where we have now added a LiDAR system and a different video camera and we can walk through, so we have done about 15 homes in the last hours so with the same. So we can reconstruct it. Uh, but to make it useful, really requires more input by the residents and by the authorities. In the particular JE, the Japan Atomic Energy Agency, which is a different challenge. Um, but the technology is certainly there. Now we can do that also from these helicopters too, the same thing. Right? You can put the system uh, on a helicopter and do the mapping from a helicopter. So this is the heavy system now on one of the RMAX Yamaha uh, helicopters. So this is now a different packaging. You can, uh, this is normally what has been done. So you have just a dosimeter like that on your helicopter and just do kind of the, the, the heat mapping of the radiation. It's, it works, it's not very accurate. Now, what you can do right now with our concept is you can reconstruct in three surfaces relative to your flight path because you have the contextual information and you estimate the post relative to the surfaces. So you get the 3D representation of objects. And you can use that now to back project the gamma ray image into it, which of course is much more accurate. So this is now the, the reconstructed image on top of the landscape. So this is the road and the river, which is cold, the road because of the washout, all the activity is washed out on the road. So you can determine that to a sub-meter resolution and look for hotspots. Okay, only possible with the, this new concept. 
to effectively map from, from the air. Okay, I think this is pretty much all I want to say in terms of the work we do related to Fukushima, the need for the outreach education, but also in terms of technology. So, and with that, I want to conclude really again in terms of the new, again, what physicists do, because we play an important role not only to elucidate the structure of the atomic nucleus and associated particles, such as the neutrino, but also in the development of new radiation detection concepts relevant for applications, such as medicine, nuclear security, and safety. Of course, I focus on security and safety. The role in education and training, as well as in communication and outreach of public, become ever more important. <coughs> That's what we have to do as a scientist. You know? We have to learn how to communicate. That will be ever more important. So our specific program provides quite an interesting and unique opportunity in the section of science, engineering, society, and education. And with advanced development of advanced concept in radiation detection, and an example again, the gamma ray vision, seeing gamma ray vision, gamma rays in our world. And also a unique opportunity to enhance the technology, uh, technological literacy through uh, outreach locally and globally. I think that's what is also extremely important and appealing, I think, certainly for our students. So they can go across the world, do measurements there, but also reach out to high schools there and engage them in what we believe in exciting research for Of course, UC Berkeley does help there too when they go to Korea or they go to China or Sweden. That they can work with UC Berkeley, so that doesn't hurt, for sure. Uh, but we are very much interested to reach out to uh, much broader international multicultural communities to have, get them involved. So in, in case something happens in the future, they can better respond without getting panicked and, and just blindly manipulated by these social networks. And with that, I will close. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk, Dr. Vetter. We have um, some of our students uh, have other classes, and, and we'll, we'll need to leave here at 5. So I'm going to give 90 seconds for any of you that need to leave to go quickly and quietly. And we'll continue with questions till 5.15. I'm sorry that I couldn't meet you. I have to go to San Jose tonight for two days. I'm oh, the yes. I'm the department chair. Um, the stuff you're working on really connects to a, a project that, that my husband there, who's going to go to dinner with you. Okay, very good, um, okay. Um, and I have been working on with uh, high schools in Mendocino County. Great, so yeah. We, I think he will tell you more. Yeah, yeah, more yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thanks. I, I, yes. Will they join us for dinner? going to go to dinner. Unfortunately, I have to go. Sure. We discussed that a little bit before. Um, I think the students take it very literally. I, I appreciate seeing them, <laughs> the young people stay. Um, they have this pressure to um, to go and experience life outside these walls. But uh, I'm going to tell the students who are enrolled in the class they are not allowed to do this. I'm Too late now for this one. Close the door. Close the door. I'll be out. Okay. Um, let's start our question and answer session. Awesome. Yes, Gary. Could, could you comment on the effective of the SafeCast project. Oh, yeah, yes. Because I'm really interested in that. I wonder oh. if you had some inside knowledge of it. Limited. I'm quite aware of it. And uh, um, SafeCast, of course, is a pretty, no, really very much uh, international program uh, where you can buy a dosimeter with a GPS as well and to measure and do your own measurements and then upload your measurement to that international SafeCast network uh, and then be part of that network, which has, uh, of course, then provides really quite interesting and, 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 and substantial mapping of, of, of radiation and across the globe. So absolutely, so that the main objective there is for everyone to have access to that technology and do their own measurement. The objective there is not necessarily the education, though. and the backbone is also not really in kind of quality control, quality assurance is not quite there yet, uh, so that's why we believe that we want to be our, the backbone of our network. But, but particularly what is separates us from them is the, our educational and outreach component. We definitely want to work with, work, uh, with, the, with the schools to encourage them also to do experiments and do the 
specific data analysis across the network. Um, so Zafecars is quite impressive. Now the sensor is still $500. Um, the one you the made is hmm? The one you made, the spider. Yeah, yeah, the one I, I, I'm aware of, which I, I so which is um, the one, that they actually have a pen case counter in there, which is kind of nice. So it's a little more, uh, a little more than what I have there. Um, even though not quite what we are getting now, because we actually get season wide uh, dosimeters uh, for a big uh, DARPA program. Which can, but that's a different story. So this again, this is all fashion. So at the end, the state of the art dosimeter will be spec communists. So that you can, and we will introduce that as school for free too. Um, so the, the safeguards, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's very impressive. And they are also extending to other measures, not just radiation. They also get uh, air pollution in, in, in adults as well. Um, so I did, like last week we had a visitor from IEA, from the International Atomic Energy Agency in, in, in Berkeley, and they are uh, organizing a workshop around even the safe cost. Uh, so to make them, their uh, community aware of the safe cost systems. So we are not trying to compete or anything, just be a little complementary. Because our system are built by our students, and being used by students in this completely well, I was impressed with the rapidity at which they gathered the information, right? I mean, is that true? Or is that they really were able to gather information that was accurate quickly? You mean in safe cars? Safe cars. Weren't they, weren't they early enough to really affect people in Japan's choices of what to do and things like that? Mm. Yes really and no. I mean, they were not there initially of course. when it really counted the most. So longer term, absolutely. But then Zafcars is not the only. I mean, there is now there are many companies who sell dosimeters in Japan. Right. So it's not only is now, now no no yeah, but the, within the next the year afterwards. Yeah. So the government didn't do a very the Japanese government didn't do a very good job of providing information early on. No. But again, it was a little <laughs> context there. Again, there was an unprecedented earthquake, unprecedented yeah, tsunami, yeah. taking out the whole coastline. Hundreds of thousands of people. Again, yeah. twenty thousand people died. I mean, worse yet, eight, yeah. about six. In total, about close to twenty thousand people died. But worse is that of the twenty thousand, two thousand have not been found. Mm -hmm. Two oh, to three thousand people have not been found, which is really bad in Japanese culture. So again, it's not just radiation. It's not no, just that radiation. Though we have their the biggest problem. Though, so it was really the, the overall. I mean, they were not dealing just with that. Like in California, you have again. Yeah, just concerned about the Asian of the quite a bit. So the, the context was quite different. It's easy for us now to judge, but again, one has to recognize that. So on your earlier slide, when you broke down exposure from natural and artificial sources, you were saying the average person would get like 3.66, I think was the number? Yeah, the millisiever per year, yes. Yeah, at the bottom of that slide, you had in India and Brazil, oh, they yes. get between 150 and 100. Yes. Is that purely from industrial sources, or is that just a different geology? That's absolutely not industrial. That's absolute natural. So okay. there are some some in Kabbalah in India, and then there's again in the Pacific. I mean, they are well known now, and they are all part of studies, and quite remarkable, interesting studies. Um, particular one area in Iran, one particular in India, and of course, and in, in, in Brazil, particularly on the beaches too. Like uh, Kabbalah, they actually are pretty warm. The black sand they have there. Uh -huh. um, Again, nothing to worry about. So, but it's just saying that yes, it's natural occurring. There are some close to uranium mines, so they have outcrops of uranium uh, um, heavy uh, 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 geology. So it's all reflecting geology, and none of in. So it's quite again, and then the other, of course, the, which is closer here is, is Colorado, Colorado, Denver, the mile high city. So it turns out that it's not only because it's one mile higher that more is more exposed to cosmic radiation, but also it's the the background is like 600 millisieverts per year in Denver uh, because of the radon exposure too. Yeah. Now, it turns out that there is a correlation between life expectancy of these people living in these areas and the exposure, which is positive. Right? That means that, that life expectancy actually scales with exposure. Now, it's very important to say that's yeah, a correlation. Yeah. It's not necessarily a causation. And with the causation, it has to be extremely careful, whatever it takes. But it's certainly not necessarily detrimental to living in this uh, uh, areas with increased radiation. So as a quick follow-up, I was just thinking, uh, you said it had no impact on life expectancy if you lived in Brazil or India or Iran, effectively. Um, would there be a reverse study possible there, where if you took people whose families are from those regions, would they have a lower rate of cancer if they lived somewhere else in the world? Is maybe their bodies and their families are more used to that higher level of exposure? So, so to prove the reverse. So, 
um, the inverse, but I think differently. So it ha it, what has been found in these people, if you add more radiation, they are better able to respond in their, on, their, on, their, on their response and their effect, responsive enough to, to, take, uh, to repair damage to radiation. They're much more able to respond and repair damage due to radiation, these people who are continuously exposed to higher radiation. That one has found. That means what you're saying in principle, people from Fukushima should be said, but again, that's, you know, they have already, they, 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 so at the end, what you would expect that people being exposed to high level of radiation, like in Fukushima, which actually is not true, and I can tell you why, it's really fascinating. Um, so they, they will adapt, like people did in the higher in the elevated areas, they will adapt. Now, what is interesting, there have been um, fascinating st stories with high school kids, they got those emitters, like not safe cars, but they own, uh, uh, but there were uh, about 700 kids, uh, 12 different schools in Japan, in, in Fukushima city particularly, uh, then a different area in Japan, uh, in, in France, in Sweden, in Ukraine, in Belarus, like in Poland, 12 different schools, and they were, they were their dosimeter for one week, right? 20% of one week, and then they compared the dose rates. And guess who had the lowest dose rate? Fukushima city. <laughs> Again, if you go to Fukushima City, it's very easy for us to detect cesium-137. But again, it doesn't matter, that doesn't mean that you, now you're really here. Because it turns out that before, the radiation exposure was really low in Fukushima. They were really low. So now you have a little more. But still, below the average of school children, again, school children, on these di 12 different places mm -hmm. in 10 different countries. Quite remarkable. And what I find really sad, that this is not more known publicly. Yes. <laughs> and that's really also to play into some degree, of course, the media in general, but also particularly in Japan. Like when it's bad, it's, you see it, in, again, particularly in Japan, but of course on social network anyway. But, but this is really incredible, interesting, and, and useful information. And incredibly important for people in Fukushima and their future to not be concerned. So do you, are you hopeful that, that um, they should be able to go back except for the hot reactor areas? They can yes. go back sooner than later. Absolutely, oh absolutely. Now, you can even argue what would have happened if they would have not have evacuated. Because you get a safe for 2,000 people. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that, is, that that's the proper response because at that time it was not really known what happened and what would happen in the future in terms of the reactors. So nevertheless, it was the best reaction to evacuate right away because of course that's what you do, you evacuate. If you have a fire, you evacuate, obviously. But in terms of uh, like a week, a few weeks later, you know it's, it's to some degree it's controlled. And you should be really concerned over what you, you go back on. Yes, there's more radiation, but again, there are some areas in the world which have that anyway. Um, again, right now, the world is not ready for that. Because, I mean, one concept you're working on, for example, is what we call the nuclear street view. Because as a matter of fact, we can now combine this information with the Google street view. Uh, we can tell about the radioactivity of homes when we pile up uh, again with our $3 million truck. So we can ultimately do that. But it's clearly, and we agree with Google, that we, we cannot do it yet. The, the impact on the real estate value would be a disaster. Because, yes, some <laughs> houses will be more radioactive than other homes. And therefore, the value of the home with more radioactivity will go down, in, of course. Yeah, yeah. So because the world is not ready, because the world does not know any, I mean, much about radiation. The same in Fukushima. Yeah, they, they, are, they are extremely concerned. Because I said zero is impossible, because some of the people still believe zero is possible. That means there has to be no cesium 137 There has to be no uh, tritium, for example, in the water for the fishery union, which is uh, extremely powerful. They say no, only zero. Otherwise, we don't go. Which is, of course, does not, I mean, one hand you can understand, on the other hand, it does not make sense. Yes. Oh, go ahead. One, one, one last question, question, then we'll, we'll take okay. other questions outside. So, some of the questions about long term effects, obviously, are going to be out there for Fukushima for many years. But going back to Chernobyl, what was that, 20 years? No, 86, as a matter of 30 plus years. I was just here for the 30th anniversary in, in April 26. Um, 
Has there been similar data collected over the year? Have there been credible population studies or whatever kind of data might be applicable? Okay, so that is definitely <laughs> a long discussion. <laughs> because that is yet another outstanding example about the uh, confusing, confusing uh, information in terms of studies. Yes, there have been enormous amount of studies. The problem is in, 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 in the Ukraine or in the Soviet Union at that time, really, remember that was Soviet Union, and it was just about to break down the Soviet Union. I, I'm old enough to remember. Hmm? I'm old enough to remember. Yeah, <laughs> but just saying, so there were a lot of, so, again, that's a longer story, it's quite interesting. So, but uh, the, 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 the battle line, there was no baseline. I had no idea about life expectancy, cancer rate, mortality rate, anything, incidence, mortality. Not, as a matter of fact, many people from the uh, now Ukraine or Belarus came to that place because they wanted to see a doctor. Right? People have never seen a doctor in their life in these areas. Right? That was poor. So they came, and then of course, oh, with their melodies, of course, whatever they had, say, oh, I was exposed to radiation, I you have to treat me. Which is understandable, but of course makes the study impossible. There is no baseline. So there was no baseline, no knowledge about that anyway, cancer rate, mortality rate. And also in terms of the control, having control, there was nothing. So now it is, but when one certainly knows about the, uh, the outcome in terms of the immediate like, uh, uh, death due to radiation, which is not necessarily radiation at all, because they, they, again, they sent firefighters to put out the fire into the unit, into the unit four. Incredible. And they died. But also because of the fire, because of the, of course, uh, debris falling down. So, when, so clearly, that 40, so 28 of those died. And then there were certainly 15. Then, of course, they didn't tell anyone. So they actually, they did not tell anyone. So the kids and the families continued to, to consume food, in particular, drink milk. Of course, highly contaminated milk with IA-9131. So that by now, an estimate what 6,000 kids got thyroid cancer because of that. But only 15 died. Of course, it's horrible, but only 15 died. So then 43 are confirmed a death due to Chernobyl. Everything else is speculation. Now, when estimates, but the estimates can be anything, but certainly not hundreds of thousands, because that's the claim by some organizations, which implies that every cancer is attributed to Chernobyl, which, of course, is nonsense. Now, one more word on that, um, because it's, if you look at now in the, in the cancer rate in, 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 in Ukraine now, it's, and you, and you, and you, that's what I normally do with my students in, the, in, the, in, the, in some of the classes I have in Ukraine, the mortality and cancer rate, which is uh, the higher, much higher cancer rate in the south than, of course, where Chernobyl is in the, in the north. Uh, the cancer rate is much lower than, than in the south. So I have them guess where Chernobyl is. Of course, I always found out the south. Because uh, that's, of course, with industry. There is a heavy industry there. Like where all the chemicals and all the other stuff all of is actually being released, which is much more harmful than the radiation. <laughs> Let's thank so. Dr. Better. Okay. Yeah.